this is uh, the third floor of the police department, the top level where we have our record section and uh, the watch commander's office is up here. The watch commander is in charge of the, the uh, field operations at this time. Uh, back this way is our detective division and our traffic division. So we'll walk in and we'll see what the man watch commander's got going on right now. This is our watch man. This is Lieutenant Al Munoz Flores. And he's in charge of the watch right now. And uh, Al can probably tell you what's going on out in the field. He has a computer here that keeps track of all the activity that's going on right now. Uh, we have a status board up here that tells us, lists all the officers who are out in the field uh, for our day watch, our traffic division, uh, our tactical watch, and our footbeat officers that are out. And again, he has direct contact with the officers in their police units uh, on this computer screen here. Uh, this has a direct, he can, he can directly contact the field units, he can contact our dispatch, he can monitor all that's going on on this uh, monitor here. So he pretty much keeps keeps track of everything that's going on right now. <clears throat> well, I'm the watch commander. Basically, the watch commander is a person who's in charge of the police department during uh, during the day. Um, I'm also, when the chief's away, I'm the acting chief of police. Um, my decisions range from everything from uh, inmates that are in the jail, whether or not we keep them or transfer them to another facility. I approve bookings, I approve reports. Um, uh, monitor the, the jail, fire alarm system, and so forth. If there's an emergency, monitor the cameras. Um, we also monitor other police departments that surround Beverly Hills, like LAPD and the Sheriff's Department. Um, some of the decisions that I make would be uh, whether, for example, if Culver City were to call us and ask for assistance, you know, it would be my decision whether or not we would deploy people over there and assist them. Uh, and answer telephone calls. This is, um, I believe, the only police department where any citizen can call the person in charge any time of the day, 24 hours. The watch commander's line is a published line, and we talk to citizens to help them sometimes understand the law, try to help them solve a problem, um, and just answer general questions sometimes. So with, with the computer, I can <coughs> monitor the status right now, for example, <coughs> it shows how many officers I have available. These are the officers that I have available, and this gives me an explanation of the officers who are in service and they're busy on different things of what they're doing. And then there's incident numbers for each event that's taking place, and I can pull up that event and find out more information, for example, who called, when they called, how long it took us to dispatch the call, and then if I have a question or I have a comment or I have some direction, I can type a message to one of the field units using this computer, and they will receive it on their laptop computer that's in the police car. Sometimes um, there's things that are sensitive or complicated that I might not want to say over the, over the radio, and um, it's, it's a real nice way of doing it. <clears throat> the officers can, for example, uh, find out if cars are stolen. Since the computer system went online, I believe we've had three stolen cars recovered as a result of that alone. It makes it very, very easy. And the nice, nice thing about it is, you know, we can communicate to the cars. I can communicate with the dispatch center, which is downstairs, and, and um, you know, it, the information is precise and specific, and there's no misunderstanding, which makes it very efficient, very efficient. It's, it's really nice. Obviously, we want to keep the jail a secure area. We can see no weapons or evidence beyond this point. We have visitors here that uh, attorneys and, and uh, other visitors can visit with the inmates. This is called a man trap. Only one door will open at a time. Go ahead and come on in. There we go. Okay, come on in. And uh, let's see if we can find a senior jailer here to help us out. Hold on a second. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell them a little bit about the jail operations up here and what we do and okay. how, uh, how, it, how it works. Okay. This is the start of the booking process right here. We bring them right here. The officers search and get all the information they need to off of the prisoner. 
then once they're done, they bring them in here, and we start the booking process right here. They step right here. The jailer is right here. She takes all the booking information from the prisoners, and we take their property and everything and store their property. And uh, a lot of times they may need showers, may, like a transit or something. We, we have shower cells here. These are two blankets and a towel and, some, and a sheet. The misdemeanors wear the blue. The felonies wear the orange jumpsuits. Okay. This is the automated uh, booking system, I mean uh, printing system right here. That's our new printer machine. But uh, we use ink over here. This is the old way. This is a fingerprint card. This is our local card. These are the uh, FBI cards. We take three of these. As, if it's a felony arrest, we take all four of these. If it's a misdemeanor, we usually just take a local card for us. And what we do when we uh, take one of these cards, we fingerprint them, put all the information in here, and we fax it. And you know, they may come up with the true name of the suspect. You know, a lot of times they'll lie when they come in here, and we'll find out who they really are. Is if say like if we have three or four arrests going on at the same time, we can either uh, cuff them to the bench, or these are holding cells right here. They, they, they have information right here. They make phone call, when they make their phone calls, they're entitled to three phone calls. This is what all the information up here. They need any information. There's our address and everything if they need to let people know where they are. This is the robber. So this is an area where we'll place prisoners if, if they are mentally unstable or if they've been very violent, um, very uncooperative, and uh, we need them to settle down. We'll place them in this, this holding cell for a little bit. And uh, as you can see, if the walls are, are made of kind of a soft material so that if they are violent, you know, occasionally we'll have a type of a prisoner who will bang his head against the wall, try and, and purposely injure himself. And uh, so we'll put them in this cell until we can move them to a, a separate facility. As you can see, there's nothing in here where they can hurt themselves. If they get sick or whatever, we can come in and hose it down. You know, we've got the drain, uh, but there's no other, as you can see, there's nothing else in, in this particular cell. And this would only be used as a very temporary holding facility. At one given time, how many, pris how many prisoners do you we actually have here? 28. 28. What's usual? Here. In a day or yeah. in a week? Uh, in a day, I'd say sometimes six, you know, in a day. Now, while our capacity is, what, 28? Yeah. We've had more. Yeah, we've had more. We've had in the 50s. During the crowds, uh, we had much more. We had a lot more. This is a typical cell. Mm -hmm. This is one of the lower bunk. The other side, we have one with an upper bunk. You can see that the walls are concrete. It's a very sterile environment. I assume this is a part of the someone maybe had something to drink and they're not going to go home. A lot of times if you have a drunk driver and they may have warrants and they're going to stay, we like to keep them in the lower box so they won't fall off and hurt themselves. But here's the shower cell in here. They can take a shower anytime they want. And then prisoners during the day, there's a um, large table and there's a, a telephone in there. If they need to make some sort of phone calls, they can. They can read magazines. We'll give them checkers or whatever. And, uh, you know, they can kind of keep themselves entertained during the day. Mm -hmm. 
and that's about it. Now, when someone is convicted of a crime in uh, in court, they're no longer no. This is this is a temporary holding facility. Um, people are brought here until they're arraigned, which is generally 48 hours from the time of arrest. Uh, once they're arraigned, they're turned over to the custody of the LA County Sheriff's Department, and from uh, there, they're transported down to uh, county jail until they have their trial. Once they're sentenced, they're either placed in in county jail or state prison, but uh, they would not come back here. This is just this is merely a temporary holding facility. How many people are in here now? One. Yeah. We took some to court today. You can see in the morning so we usually take people to court, so it's, it's generally fairly If we have to keep them longer, we have to get a probable cause to keep them longer. Uh, this guy, he was arrested yesterday, but because it was a felony, we'll have to keep him till Monday. So we have to get a probable cause sign to keep him here. This is our, our control area up here. We always keep one jailer up in this area, and, and uh, the jailer assigned to this position here basically controls and monitors. There's a series of, of screens and uh, controls, and they monitor all what's going on in the jail. They have the, the uh, yeah, well, let's walk around and we'll, we'll take a shot. Uh, this shows the outside where the sally port is. This is the main entrance where you came walking in the, uh, the police department, the front desk where the officer sits. We can not only monitor inside the jail, but right here is the corridor, different areas. This is the, uh, the main door where we walked in out front here. And you can switch cameras so you can, you can see different areas in the, uh, in the department. And what we tell them to do is to follow this blue line along the, uh, the floor here. Come all the way down. There's a door down here that leads to an elevator. And we can monitor in the hallway. Uh, there's, you know, cameras that uh, we can watch them the whole time. We tell them, come down here. Follow the blue line, get right in the elevator. Mm -hmm. And then we control the elevator. As you see, there's no buttons. They can't control it. We control the elevator from the major control panel. There's a camera up here, so we, keep, we monitor them constantly. And uh, we send them down the elevator. And they exit down onto uh, Rexford Drive, and uh, away they go. This is the, uh, the patrol area. This is really a non-public area. Um, our patrol lieutenants have their offices in here. Our, our watch commander, or our, uh, the uh, sergeant, will prepare for roll call down here. This area in here, we, we keep our equipment. We've got radios, shotguns. The officers will come in here and check out their radios. Um, you can see other equipment we have in here. Um, car seats in case we have to transport an infant if their parent was injured in an accident or something like that. Um, or on, if they are unfortunately arrested. But uh, this is where we keep all of our other equipment. But this is uh, basically where the officers come before uh, their briefing. The so command sit down, the sergeant or the lieutenant, to whoever the watch commander is, will uh, take position up here and they will go through the daily activities, what's been happening, give the officers their assignments. Uh, occasionally they'll get involved in roll call training. Uh, we're, we constantly train. Uh, there's always new information coming up for the officers to uh, learn and so we'll do training uh, in roll call. We have, uh, you can see a TV and a VCR. Occasionally we'll have training tapes that we play for the officers. Roll call usually lasts, so anywhere from 15 to, to 20 minutes. Uh, after the officers are done with roll call, they go over to uh, the equipment room. From the equipment room, they go down the elevator one level, they get in their police cars, and out they go. In police work, you have to stay in pretty good shape, you know. The police officers are always getting joked uh, about eating donuts and hanging out at the donut shop. But uh, as you can see, we have a lot of physical fitness equipment in here. The, uh, we have Stairmaster, uh, Life Cycle, and the free weights. 
uh, a lot of our officers involved in, in running. In fact, you'll see we participate in a race every year, a 120-mile relay race, uh, in which officers, uh, 20 officers run about six hours. hours. Uh, it takes about, actually, about 13, 13 hours, 14 hours or so. Uh, to, to run the race, but 20 officers and they average about six miles apiece. So the officers stay in pretty good, uh, pretty good condition. Are they required to? Uh... They are required to maintain a minimum level of physical fitness, and uh, as an incentive to maintain even better fitness, the uh, officers may earn up to a five and a half percent bonus for staying in top physical shape. We have tests uh, every six months to make sure that the officers are maintaining that level. And if they do, uh, then they receive the, the bonus. In fact, we have the tests uh, every six months at the high school. So maybe a lot of the, a lot of the uh, students there may have seen us out uh, in the mornings uh, doing pull-ups and push-ups and sit-ups and running and whatnot. So. As you can see, we've got uh, a big locker room. Yeah. The officers have uh, double lockers. Uh, our motorcycle officers, because they have so much equipment, are assigned it to, uh, to uh, two lockers apiece. But uh, it runs yeah, quite, quite a ways. Are there that many uh, officers? We have, we have, we're authorized 132 sworn officers right now. Because of hiring freeze, we're at 128. We will be hiring two more female officers. We, that'll up us to eight female officers out of 130. So, have 122 male uh, police officers. Mm -hmm. So, as as I was indicating, I probably did this a little backwards, but this is the first stop for the police officers. They'll come in here, put on their uniforms, get dressed, uh, or they might have come in early to work out. Uh, we have a complete shower, shower facility, locker room with a or. Uh, bathroom over here with six showers and a sauna uh, and come in, work out, get ready for their tour of duty. From here, they will go out uh, the door over here, go into directly into the roll call room where they'll have roll call. After roll call, they'll uh, go over to the equipment room, get their equipment, the shotguns, radios, and then proceed down to the basement level where they'll get in their patrol cars and out they go. This, this is uh, Christy Nye. She's our, our supervisor who's in charge of the dispatch area at this time. This is the supervisor's console here, and she can monitor everything that's going on in the room, which includes our fire dispatch, uh, our main dispatch, our uh, the parking enforcement area, and the uh, telephones. These are our monitors. They tell us what everybody's doing right now. So I can look up here and see what every officer or fire equipment is doing. That's much like the screen that's down at the watch command. At the watch command. Can you tell them a little bit about what the consoles and, and uh, how you can determine which which officers are broadcasting and whatnot? Well, they look a lot. It looks a lot more confusing than it really is. Each one of these is a different channel. This is our police channel one. And the number you see here is the last person that talked, like right now it just changed to a motor. That's uh, Officer Gates, Mary Two. We know who, who just transmitted because he just clicked his mic and he said something. But if we didn't understand who it was, we could look up there and see that's who it was. This is our fire frequency up here. That's the fire console over there. He takes all the fire calls and dispatches fire. So we keep that our fire console. Uh, any other other ones can be police. This one I can switch over and take over. Right now it's uh, Leander's doing it over on that, on that console. But it's just a matter of typing in a little thing and I can take control. Any one of us can take control. It, it all depends on whose turn it is to work the radio. But that stays fire over there all the time. What's the process if a phone call comes in? What would happen from that? Uh, I could take a phone call, they need the police, you know, I type in the address right here, I type in what kind of call it is, uh, something in the name, whatever, and then I hit this button, and it'll send the call to the dispatcher, the dispatcher will get it in the waiting window here, and then she'll go ahead and put it out on the radio and dispatch it. Our cars now have um, the MDTs in them, where they can type us, we can type them, they'll get their message in a little computer where they're going and what they're doing and then they'll put themselves on scene, and, or we can put them on scene, whichever. So we're working back and forth computer-wise now. Do they have computers? We have computers. So it's just all a question of we take a call, we give it to the dispatcher, the dispatcher dispatches it to the officer, the officer goes en route, you know, 
he just he takes the call. He clears. He can clear himself. He can do everything. He can run his own plates now too, or we can run the plates depending on you know, if they're busy or not. So. Three ten. Are you ready to copy? If we get a nine one one call, uh, we can tell. You know, say a, a person was only able to get to the phone and dial 911 and wasn't able to talk, um, we can tell where that call has originated from and we will send a, a unit to that location. So we have that capability as, as well. The address, this person that just called a minute ago didn't mean to call me and he stayed on the phone and said, I'm sorry, it's an accident. I can call him back at this phone number, which we have to do, we have to verify hangups. And, you know, if he said, oh, well, it was a wrong number, or something, you know, I'll tell them, don't do that again, please let us know, or it could be sometimes every now and then they'll hang up because there is an emergency, you know, right. and uh, we've gotten some good calls by hang-ups. We call back and and they're in the middle of something screaming, so, but that's, this is good because now we know where they called and if we can't reach them, we send an officer out there. Mm -hmm. And like I said, sometimes we've had some good calls that way. It's usually police, not the fire? Um, not well. We don't. We can't determine if we can't call back. We, we, but we send police out. We can get there quicker than fire because we're out in the field and they're they're in the station. And if it turns out to be fire, then we just we got the fire guy right there. It takes one second to send somebody. Okay. So. And here's my cameras. I can see what's going on throughout the station, and outside. You can watch the cars go by too. It's one of our canine canine cars. We have four canine units in the city. They're they're deployed uh, primarily during the evening hours. student who uh, he has to be taking 12 units or more and maintain a C average and he works as kind of a student worker almost like an intern and he'll work in the different areas of the police department uh, we have some assigned to what we call vehicle control which is probably what he's doing they maintain all the police cars they make sure they're they're gassed they're washed that they have a supply of flares or whatever other supplies that that we keep in the trunks of the car so that the cars are ready to go at, at any given time uh, cadets also work in say the identification bureau assisting with fingerprinting uh, photo for the photography uh, crime scene investigation that type of thing and we use them all over all over the police department in all different areas and it's a good learning experience for them uh, and it's also very beneficial to us uh, we now have the new the mobile communications terminals uh, as you can see they're basically a 286 uh, PC this is the uh, where the supervisors can monitor all the calls and, and everything that's going on out in the field, much as you saw up in dispatch and as you saw um, up in uh, the watch commander's desk. We have cellular telephones in the supervisor's cars. Frequently we'll find that the officers will encounter a situation out in the field where they need to uh, make a phone call to do some field investigation. They might want to call somebody to uh, see if if uh, so-and-so is supposed to have the car or to confirm that, that somebody is supposed to be doing, you know, something. So we have cellular phone calls there. This is our main, main radio frequency. This is our uh, light bar. This is what, what operates the lights and sirens. And this is uh, an arrow stick, which we have on the back of the, the light bars, which we can use, say we're stopped in traffic and we want to use for traffic control, to have the lights direct the cars around the uh, police unit. We also have a scanner in the supervisor's cars. The scanners allow us to monitor the activity that's going around in, in the uh, surrounding agencies. There's also one more radio in here. It's called uh, Claymars. Claymars unit also allows us to talk on the radio to other uh, agencies that also have the Claymars uh, capability. It allows us to talk to the air units that we utilize from the Sheriff's Department or from uh, the Los Angeles Police Department. We have a PA system. You can talk out uh, the spotlights that you'll see uh, will light up 
uh, during the evening hours when we, when we stop a police when we stop a, uh, a car for traffic violation or for some other violation so as you can see there's quite a bit of equipment uh, the cars are equipped with shotguns the shotgun racks are uh, mounted overhead here we now have the plexiglass to separate us from the prisoners so the prisoners can't you know spit on you or or kick you or anything else uh, so this is kind of a protective uh, device there. With Beverly Hills Police Department, you need at least 60 units or an AA degree to even apply. Uh, other departments don't have such a strict education requirement, but in Beverly Hills we feel that education is very important. Uh, a lot of universities offer college curriculums uh, in the area of, of criminal justice. They have majors, actual criminal justice majors. You can major in, in law enforcement, in corrections, uh, there's quite a few different options. So we're finding that more and more of our applicants have bachelor's degrees, or at least have an AA degree before they even come on board here. Uh, once you go through the hiring process, you have to take a written test, you have to take a physical agility test, an oral test, uh, then you will have to take a medical exam, a polygraph exam, which is a lie detector test, and a psychological screening. If you pass all those successfully, uh, which about one in every 100 candidates does, and you get hired, you go through a police academy. Now, the academy that we use for the Beverly Hills Police Department generally is the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Uh, that's about a four-month academy, uh, 16 weeks at the Sheriff's Department with some ride-alongs here uh, with training officers. Once you successfully graduate from the police academy, you then go through a four-month training program here at the police department with a field training officer. So it's quite a, a, a detailed uh, experience to, to go from very start to finish. And, and generally, it'll ta you know, it takes quite some time before a police officer is ready, prepared to go out in the field uh, on his own and handle the day-to-day -day routine. Now, from there, as a patrol officer, you have a lot of options. Generally, that's where everybody starts is in patrol. Uh, you can go from there to being a uh, school resource officer, the DARE officer, work in our personnel and training section, work in our detective division, work as a motorcycle officer, work as a canine officer. We have what's called a special tactics unit, which they do a lot of surveillance, undercover work, that type of thing. You can work vice or narcotics. There's all sorts of different areas in the police department that you can work. So it, it offers a, a wide uh, variety of uh, experiences. So that's one of the nice things about being in law enforcement. You're not always tied behind a desk. You get to work with people, help people, and throughout uh, a lengthy career, a 30-year career, you can uh, work in any number of areas in the police department. So that makes it really nice. Okay, this, this is the range area, and this is Sergeant Bill Lemke. He is one of our range masters. We have several range masters on the police department. Uh, who coordinate our, our monthly range training. The officers are required to qualify once a month with their handguns. We also have periodic qualifications with shotguns. So, and in order to do that, we have to have range masters down here to coordinate the training, to supervise it, oversee it. And if we encounter any problems, then the officers will be required to go through uh, like a remedial training program or that type of thing. But generally speaking, the officers stay very proficient with their weapons. We try and vary the courses down here and uh, you know that's that's kind of it in a nutshell well, maybe Sergeant Lumpke can tell you a little bit about how it's set up and what we do well like the lieutenant said every month we change the uh, qualifications to what we have this month we have four targets that are uh, set at 2, 4, 10, and 20 yards away. They turn at different times when the targets turn. The officers draw their weapon from the holster and they fire at the targets. And also this month we have a uh, four round shotgun course where they will shoot the handgun and the shotgun at the same time. He controls, he can talk over the, the speaker system. He can stand back here, it's computerized. We can pre-program it or he can turn the, he can turn the targets to face. Uh, we'll have silhouettes, we'll yeah, use... The target turns, that's what the officers will fire. So it's all computerized. The officer will stand uh, in, in a certain area, and as the targets turn, like Sergeant Lemke said, the officer will be required to shoot. We're three levels below the... Uh, below the surface up there, so we're, we're underground, I don't know, 60 feet or, or uh, 
or so, that is a specially made bullet trap. So there's no way for that to, to hit anybody. As you can see, it's kind of angled up so the bullets deflect and go up. also where we keep our mobile command center, which is a, approximately a 33-foot uh, motorhome that we had custom-made uh, that's designed as a field command post. We've used this in a lot of different situations, and uh, primarily it's, it's meant for, for disaster situations so that we can go set up, uh, or if something happened here to our, our uh, police department, with the communication systems that we would have a fully functional communication center and it also has a meeting area in the back so that if if you had uh, say for instance uh, a situation and you had some some command personnel out in the field who needed to meet and discuss how to handle a certain situation there's a, a meeting area so I'll take you in the uh, mobile command center but basically we have a ham radio set up in here we have the capability of, of uh, hooking up to a hard line telephone telephone line. We've got, uh, you can see all the radios we have up in here. All these are different radio s systems we can we can program into several different several different frequencies. We have basically uh, six six radios. We can we can get into the uh, uh, the police frequency, the fire frequency, the public works frequency. If we're working with highway patrol, their frequency, any other police agency's frequencies, we can tune into uh, National Guard, Red Cross, whomever, to have full communications capabilities out of this this uh, command center. Uh, Red Cross shelter information, weather service, uh, a lot of Red Cross information. We'll try and keep that on the board here. Uh, we have a television set, actually one on each side, uh, as long with a VCR in the back. Mm -hmm. TV set so we can monitor news programs and what's going on uh, in case of, of a disaster and emergency. In the back, uh, behind you again, we have another... We have another uh, TV along with the VCR so that if we are, if we do have a situation going on out in the field and we want to videotape it and bring it back for intelligence information or just to show uh, department heads or city officials what's going on, we can, we can do that. It's fully self-contained. We've got a full restroom uh, in here, microwave, refrigerator, Mr. Coffee. water, and coffee, coffee machine, coffee. scanner, uh, banks to keep our radios charged, batteries charged, again, uh, hard line telephones, a lot of supplies. We have another table that sets up right here, so basically you can have a conference of, you know, however many people you can fit in here, uh, and actually you can fit quite a few. If you need to keep plans, uh, maps, anything, uh, we have an area. This is a four screen media board, electronic media board. We can draw diagrams, keep facts, figures up here on this board. It then rotates around. We have four screens this size. We can print out one screen. Uh, it has a printer. We can print out one screen. We can print out all four screens on one piece of paper. Uh, anything, anything that uh, that we need on here. So, air conditioning, heating. You can use it in in all types of uh, weather. So, I've been very, very, very functional, very useful vehicle for us. In time of a, a disaster. If it were necessary, we would we would call into operation the emergency operations center, and uh, you can see we we reconfigured the tables here. We have a bank of telephones that we pull out, uh, computers. You can see all the the uh, whiteboards here. T we use to keep uh, track of all statistics and whatnot, and this becomes the the uh, main center where all the emergency operations, field operations, would be coordinated from. Uh, you'd have your department heads, you'd have your representatives from uh, water and power, from the phone company, from 
whomever, the gas company, as well as you know city officials that would be in here to coordinate whatever the disaster response would be. It also doubles as a training room. You can see we can divide the room in half, set it up as a classroom, and conduct training classes in here, which we frequently do. Uh, take the tables out uh, as well, and you can use it as uh, we've done some uh, uh, physical fitness training in here, some hand-to-hand -hand, uh, combat uh, self-defense type training in here. Thank <laughs> you.